And here we are, camp meeting weekend, and it's Sabbath now, and we get to be together, and oh God, be in our midst, be in our midst, and speak to us. That's what I want to pray right now. Let's pray. That's why we've come, Father. It's, it's, it's camp meeting. It's time to be with friends and to be on the platform with, with classmates tonight. That, that, that's a special bonus. It doesn't happen very often. We're with each other. There's going to be a whole lot of high five, <coughs> high fiving and, and hugging and, and, and just chattering today. And you love it. You're, you, you, you'll be smiling with your arms reached around us. You're beaming. You're saying, enjoy this, enjoy this. But we've come to enjoy you as well. And so these few moments we have as the Sabbath begins, the sun dips in that western horizon. The gift of this day. You made it for us, not us for it. You made it for us so that we could be with you. Honor our desire for that to take place all 24 hours ahead of us. We humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me put the title slide on the screen for you, please. Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, as Ed mentioned just a moment ago, title of uh, tonight's teaching, Me and Mrs. Potiphar. I want to read a line. I'm not going to put the, t- the text is not on the screen, so please open your Bible to Genesis 39. I want to read just a line. Genesis 39, I want to pick up the... It's actually the last, it's it's a longer verse, verse 6, Genesis 39, verse 6. Those of you joining us tonight for the first time, we've already had two installments of the life of Joseph. This most favorite of Bible studies outside of the story, but most favorite of Bible stories, rather, outside of the story of Jesus. Without doubt, hands down, no doubt. So if you missed the first two, you can pick them up somewhere on this campus, I'm sure. But this is the tail end of verse 6. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. So here's a question for you. Is it a sin to be attractive? And we just read it. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. Don't people like that make you sick? Don't you wish there were a law against it or something? How could you do this? It's very interesting that that the same Hebrew words Moses uses to describe Joseph here, he has already used to describe Joseph's mother earlier, Rachel, like mother, like son. The same words here for Joseph, they're translated, well-built and handsome. The NIV renders them for Rachel, she had a lovely figure and was beautiful. So it can't be a sin to be attractive, can it? No. No. But is it a sin to be attracted? Now, that's a different question. A trickier question that's going to need a more nuanced response. A response tucked away right here in the story, me and Mrs. Potiphar. So without any further ado, let's go. Genesis chapter 39, verse 1. Put that on the screen for you. Now, Joseph, sold by His jealous brothers. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, high-ranking, high-ranking Potiphar. Now Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Secret service. Captain. Now Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought Joseph. I'll take him. Bought him off the slave block. Bought Joseph from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there to Egypt. Sold as a slave by his brother, 17-year-old boy Joseph. Remember, he's 17. 17. Bought. I'm sure that boy sobbed the whole way from the purple mountain majesties of his homeland in Canaan. Sobbed and sniffled the whole way to the unknown fate awaiting him as a slave in Egypt, sold by his brothers. Bad news. You've been sold as a slave. 
Oh, but good news. You've been bought by a high official in Pharaoh's court. And guess what? If somebody has any dreams for you in the Egyptian society, it is absolutely imperative that you get placed in a home that will have the traffic of the intelligentsia of the nation. You will need to learn the social niceties that come with living in the upper echelons, the rarefied atmosphere of human wealth and prestige and power. It's no accident that when the buyers lined up that afternoon and called out their bids, that God, with his plan A, that feels like plan Z to Joseph, but this plan A makes certain that you, Potiphar, you will buy that boy. I need him in your house. He gets bought. Verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Bad news, your dreams about becoming a great leader have obviously and dead ended. Finis. Good news, however, your work ethic, your work ethic will bring the approbation of heaven itself upon that pagan household because you are there. Verse 3. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, that would be Joseph, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his master's eyes and became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Keep reading. Verse 5. From the time he put Joseph in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. Real estate holdings. Everything got blessed because of this Hebrew boy that now works for me. And Potiphar says, everything, boy, everything I have is under your brilliance. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Remember, Joseph was born a leader. Did we note that the first night? Wherever Joseph goes, psh, elevator to the top. Eleven brothers, psh, who's the leader? Joseph. Household of slaves, psh, who's the leader? Joseph. He will keep doing this through the entire narrative. We got some major success going on here. I read for my worship every day a psalm. I learned that from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You may, may have heard of him, that Lutheran uh, pastor theologian who was executed by direct order of Himmler. We've learned in the latest biography of Bonhoeffer. But anyway, he was writing from prison one day, and he said, I find great comfort in reading a psalm a day. And I thought, well, you know, I ought to try that. So I have been ever since. When I get to Psalm 150, the next day it's Psalm 1. And on and on and on. The greatest prayers and hymns in human literature. Not such a bad idea to begin your worship every day with, with a psalm. Anyway, Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight shall be in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters whose leaves never fail. All that he does shall prosper. Exhibit A, 17 years old. I see some teenagers here. 17 years old. I see some younger than teenagers here. Your age. Blessed is the boy. Blessed is the girl. Blessed is the teenager who trusts in the Lord. In my law, meditate day and night. And your leaf will never wither, and everything you do will succeed. That's what happened to Joseph. We have major success going on here. From a shackled slave, now turned loose, but indentured to the Lord of the house. Wow. Verse 6. 
So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. Can you believe this? Now, this is a period of 10 years. This is not all the day one. You have to earn it. You have to do it the hard way. You have to earn those stripes. You have to earn the right to climb the ladder. You don't just get it because who you are because now you're nobody. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Do I have food today? Yes, sir. Here it comes. That was all he cared about. Give me my meals. Everything else you got. Now, here comes that line. Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Yo, boy, come to bed with me. Bad news. Potiphar is married to Mrs. Potiphar. By the way, that's bad news for both Joseph and Potiphar. Good news. The lady of the house wants to have sex with you. When I was here in school, I think, there was a radio st station in town, uh, WGOW. No longer exists, no doubt, because it's AM. Was. Anyway, the song writer Billy Paul once wrote a piece, and I may have heard it on WGOW, I don't know. He wrote a piece entitled, Me and Mrs. Jones. Me and Mrs. Jones, we've got a thing going on. We both know that it's wrong, <clears throat> but it's much too strong to let it go now. Turns out that happened to be Mrs. Potiphar's favorite song. <laughs> and she wanted to teach the boy, the young, studly, well-built now, Ten years into it, ten years into it, he is now 27 years of age. We got all this chronology embedded in the narrative. He is now 27. He's not that stripling 17-year-old acne kid. He's the macho leader of the entire servanthood of that estate, and he's single. She's hoping that it'll become his favorite song, too. Good news, Mrs. Potiphar wants to go to bed with you. He said, well, how could that possibly be good news? Oh, because simply, look. All it takes is to yield to the wishes of the lady of the house. History is replete, by the way, with stories of slaves who became paramours or who became, who became mistresses to the man of the estate. And by that became freed from their indentured status. Some of them went on, as history tells us, to live great lives of service to humanity. So this is a perfect opportunity. You remember those dreams, boy? Guess what? This could be your ticket to leadership. Mm. But there will be no me and Mrs. Jones for Joseph. No Mrs. Potiphar either. For the lady of the house has terribly miscalculated. Joseph is not only big on his God, he is good to go for his God, no matter what. Miscalculated. Let me read, uh, let me read verse 7 again. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. Now listen to, his, listen, to his, listen to his response. Rebuttal to the invitation. With me in charge, he told her, my master, you have to know to whom you belong if you're going to survive this life. You have to know to whom you belong. Never forget that. 
My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted. Because that's the truth about life. Whatever you have has been entrusted to you. Your wife has been entrusted to you. Your husband has been entrusted to you. Your friend has been entrusted to you. Your date has been entrusted to you from one who is trusting you to know what to do. My master, I know whom I serve. My master has entrusted to me. I know I hold this only at his command. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. Verse 9, here we go. No one is greater in this house than I am. I know my status. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, Mrs. Potiphar. How then? Because you are his wife, by the way. You are his wife. How then? Joseph asks, could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? What is unfolding before our eyes right now on the IMAX screen of Scripture is the anatomy of a temptation. Seven components to it, quivering, moving as if almost imbued with a life of their own. Seven components to temptation. Not just the temptation to sex, but the temptation to sin, period. Whatever your favorite sin happens to be. Seven components to the temptation you face every day to your favorite sin. The moment I said sin, you thought of it. The Holy Spirit made sure, because he knew what was coming. He made sure you thought of it. That sin, seven components to its temptation. Grab your study guide. Let's go. Let's just scribble these down. When the seven are done, I'm out of here. All right? Seven components. Seven. Dark, quivering, nearly alive, nearly breathing components to every temptation you and I face. Appetite, right there. Gluttony, yep, same one, <laughs> right there. Addiction, you got it, these seven. Lust, but of course. Dishonesty, you have it. Self-worship and pride and hubris and ego, you got it. They're right here, seven of them, almost with a life of their own. Seven components to the anatomy of a temptation. Let's go. Number one, put it on the screen for you. Keep your finger move, your, your hands moving because we're going to fly through this. By the way, if you happen to miss one, you go to our website, www.pmchurch.tv. You're looking for Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat. You'll find the study guide there, and the answers will all be at the bottom. So you'll, you'll have the key there. The anatomy of a temptation. Number one, temptation is always, write it down, a shortcut. Always a shortcut. You see that on the screen? Write it down. One of the most profound definitions of temptation I've come across, and I'm, I speak this with, with, with conviction, is from the Scottish writer and preacher Oswald Chambers in his masterpiece, his classic, My Utmost for His Highest. Here's how Chambers describes temptation, and I have it there in your study guide for you, I do believe. Put it on the screen. Temptation is a suggested shortcut to the realization of the highest at which I aim, not towards what I understand as evil, but towards what I understand as good. I, I thought that, was, that, 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 was, that displays a bit of prescience. We are never tempted to do what is evil. What you and I believe is evil is, is abhorrent to us. Why would I want to do what's evil? I don't want to do what's evil. That, that's, that's yuck. What gets us every single time is when we are tempted to do that which we believe is good. Only the temptation will ever be a shortcut. I'll get you there faster. I'll get you there faster. Come on, let's do. Always it's to what's good. No matter, no matter what your, 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 your darling sin, your prevailing temptation might be, it doesn't matter. It's always a shortcut. By the way, it was that way, Psst. you. 
What's the matter for you? What's the matter for you? Are you who they're saying you are? You really? This God come down to earth? If you are, you're probably here on some kind of mission, I suppose. I want to know. Let me see it. Show me. See these rocks? Turn them into bread. I'll believe you. I'll give you what you want. The three temptations of Jesus in the wilderness are all shortcuts. Every single one. Shortcut. Finally, the last one. Bow down to me. I'll give you everything you came for. I'll give you the entire planet. I'm the prince of the world anyway. It's mine to give. Bow down and worship me. Every temptation is a temptation, is a, is a temptation to a shortcut. Sexual temptation, the same way. Tempters offer to a shortcut to what the creator obviously intended to be very good. I mean, isn't that what he said at the end of Friday? After he has the male and the female together? This is very good. Shortcut. God say you're supposed to, uh, you know, get married and all this kind of thing. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Do it now. It's good. Every temptation. It's a temptation to a shortcut. Everybody knows, since, since we're talking about sex, that the Creator's super high octane gift of sex comes with His divinely inspired operating instructions. Move outside of the operating parameters and you're dead. And we know that. You don't have to be a believer to know this. Everyone knows that unregulated, uncontrolled sex can kill you physically, socially, morally, spiritually. Let's be honest, we live in a culture today that is so sexed up that it believes the the practice of sex is our inalienable right guaranteed by the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> we have these inalienable rights. Sex is one of them. We live in an age now, not unlike Sodom, I suppose, or not unlike the flood. I think it was Jesus who said that, didn't he? Just before I come. We live in an age now that believes having sex with anyone at any time is our right as animals evolved into homo sapiens. Now look, we're not going to have sex with children. I mean, we got, we're, like, we're not dumb. Let them grow up. I mean, we understand about social scarring. Although there are a thousand websites that beg to differ with you. And we'll give you children if you want. You know, we're not supposed to have sex with beasts. I mean, please, that's just... <sighs> Although there are a myriad of websites that will suggest that's your right as well. This is the age in which we live. High octane. Was it a temptation for Joseph? Are you kidding? This is your ticket, boy. Always a shortcut. Number one. Number two, temptation is always a betrayal of trust. Would you jot that down, please? Temptation is always a betrayal of trust. I mean, Joseph responds, we just noted it a moment ago to Mrs. Potter, for everything my master owns has been entrusted to me. Everything. What I'm tempted to do always is a betrayal of the trust. I trusted you with her. I trusted you with him. I trusted you with you. I trusted you with that. All that money, I trusted you. I trusted you with that honesty. I told you not to look. I told you. Now, temptation always is a betrayal of trust. Number three. Temptation is always repetitive. Boy, do we know that. Look at verse 10. And though Mrs. Potiphar spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Is there anybody here who has not suffered under the withering hellfire of the prince of darkness himself day after day, all the guns blazing, 
straight at your heart, straight at your mind. Anybody here a stranger to this day after day insanity that will not let me go? Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul begs. Who gets me free from this? Nope. There's no get out of jail free card for life on this planet. No, 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 no. Number three, temptation is always, always repetitive. And just when you think the hideous whisper is gone at last, you walk around a corner and with that, with that sadistic grin of his, he's there all over again. Day after day after day. Wow. Number four, jot it down. Temptation, there are only seven of these. Temptation is always location sensitive. What do you mean by that, Dwight? Well, let's look at it here. Verse 11. One day, Joseph went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. Well, that's strange. That is really weird. Looks like somebody might have set this thing up. Where's everybody? Why am I all alone in this building? And then the patter of bare feet down the hallway. Ah. Temptation is always location sensitive. You're all alone. Nobody there but you. And that laptop. Minding your own business with that silly little mouse that under the guidance of your directed mind and clicking finger and there on your screen is pornography. Sex for free. Temptation is always location sensitive. The nice thing about a smartphone is that it can be very unsmart at times. Hooked up to uh, 4G, what are they up to now? 50G? I don't know. Huh? Smartphone, anywhere, anywhere on earth. Pull that little smartphone out. I can surf the web to my heart's content. And nobody knows what I'm surfing. <laughs> Just push the thumb on the glass, open. That's how it works. Temptation is always location sensitive. I'm reading a book right now called The Shallows. I was reading it um, this afternoon. The Shallows, it's written by Nicholas Carr. A powerful indictment of, of uh, well, it may, now let me, let me rephrase that. It's not an indictment, it's a, it's a powerful, it's a powerful analysis of how the internet has changed, has radically, physically, physiologically changed the way we now think and behave. And we're used to thinking now and reading with hyperlinks. Now he's not talking about, he's not a Christian, I don't think. He's not talking about us. But you and I know that all, sometimes all it takes is a little pop-up ad. Girls from Russia. Why are they always from Russia? I guess what you're supposed to do with a pop-up ad is click on it. Fortunately, you don't. But it's location sensitive. I mean, it's just where you, just you all alone. The house is empty. Come on. That's what's happening here. Christianity Today. I'm minding my own business, reading it through, the latest issue. And I come across these words, stunning line. Whoo. Put it on the screen for you. Kind of embarrassed to have to show you this, but let's go ahead. In fact, I think you have to fill it. It's in your study guide. So you're going to fill this in. This is Christianity Today. It's not the latest. It's the next latest. A national survey among churches conducted over the past five years revealed that 68% of Christian men and 50% of pastors view pornography regularly. One half of the pastors you saw on this platform tonight. Well, you know which half I'm in, so. 
Sorry, guys. <laughs> but you know, how this, you know how stats work, okay. 68% of Christian men quit laughing at the platform. 68%, that's 7 out of 10. That would be you, 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 you three off. You, 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 you three off. That's what it is. 68%, 7 out of 10. Regularly, regularly view pornography. But even more shocking is that 11 to 17-year-old boys are reported to be its greatest users today in America. 11 to 17. We celebrated little Jason's birthday last night. It was nine. God bless him. And his parents will protect him. 11 to 17 are the great purveyors and users of internet porn. A friend of mine sent me an article in uh, GQ magazine, which is a magazine for men, that reports on a recent survey of a Reddit community called NoFap. And I'm quoting the community now, which is committed to abstaining from porn. They're trying to help guys off of their uh, pornographic or pornography addiction. Abstaining from porn, this, and go, continue to quote, and has helped this, this community, has helped researchers to open the door to a better understanding of the effects of pornography in our lives, end quote. Listen to this. Let me just run some numbers by the little space here. You want to scribble it down? That's fine. 12% of no fappers in this little community report watching five or more hours of internet porn every week. 12%. That's one eighth. 59% report watching between four and 15 hours of porn Per week, that's almost half, four, between four and 15. Almost 50% of those in the NoFap community have never had sex with someone else in their lives. It's not like they're getting ready to go out. They haven't. 42% of them are male college students visiting porn sites regularly. 53% of NoFappers develop their porn habit between the ages of 12 and 14. Mother, do you know what your boy is doing with that thing? When, how old was your boy when you gave him that smartphone? Was that very smart? You gotta, we, guys, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a full court press, if I can mix the metaphors, a full court press battle to death, to the death. And I believe with all my heart that Lucifer has marked the male half of the human race. And by the way, we now know that the female half is attracted to pornography as well. But he has marked the male half of the human race for destruction. I will possess your mind. Through pornography, I will possess your mind and control your life. And you will be mine forever and ever. Amen. And he hates the word amen. This is not something, well, come on, you got a problem on some college campus somewhere, deal with it. Are you kidding? We've got a problem in the, in the church in America. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, I've had Adventist pastors talk to me. One of them finally came out, wrote a book. He was a co-host on Net 98. Young pastor, wrote a book. You can get in your ABC book, a ABC uh, bookstore now. Breaking the Silence is the title of his book. Adventist pastor. Hey, listen. It's not just Adventist pastors. It's Adventist, period. This is a, no, this is a, this is a playing, we, we, we're playing for keeps now. Strategy. I'll get him. I will kill the gift of the garden. I'll kill the Sabbath. I'll kill sex. I'll kill anything with the fingerprints of the creator upon it. That's what's going on. Wow. So I went online today. I said, okay, I want to know how much uh, money is being spent on porn. There are nearly, I found this out, there are nearly 25 million porn sites globally. 25 million globally. Generating roughly $14 billion in revenue per year as of 2012. With, and one website, you might in, want to check this one out, covenanteyes.com. It's to help people get away from porn. It's to help parents set up porn shields for their homes. I'm going to give you that again. Sorry to make a slide out of it. www.covenanteyes Covenant Eyes E-Y-E-S dot com They have a running ticker 
of how many people have been search, made searches for pornography on the, on the web since the beginning of 2015. At the time I wrote the number down, it was 911,948,629 people have gone into pornography searches. We're not dealing with some sort of backwater, inconsequential human quirk. This is an all-out, full-blown strategy to destroy the human race, particularly the men. All the guns of hell blazing simultaneously. 911 million searches, and we're not even halfway through the year. But location sensitive, all alone with that tablet, all alone with that cell phone or that laptop. That's not only, that's not the only place. And as long as we're talking about sex, it can also mean when you're alone with your date, alone with him, you are a sitting duck for the same heavy artillery. We know, don't we? Yeah. The brazen way some couples if this were a college campus, I'd say this. I'm going to go ahead and say it, even though we're not a college campus here. The brazen way some couples are sexually active with each other is stunning as if premarital sex is a common, necessary ritual for getting acquainted. Premarital sex gets you the same way pornography does with all the same residual fallout. Christianity Today again, I'll put it on the screen. You don't have to fill this one in. I think you have this in your study guide. When a woman is nursing her child, fascinating, mothers and men, listen. When a woman is nursing her child and she's skin to skin with her baby, her brain releases a neurochemical called oxytocin, which emotionally bonds her to her child. The same thing happens during sex. God designed oxytocin as the, as the glue for human bonding. During a sexual release, oxytocin or oxytocin, along with other neurochemicals, are released and cause us to emotionally bond with our partner. When you watch porn, powerful neurotransmitters such as dopamine are also released, which bond you to those images. I gave you, I, I gave, I gave you an owner's manual. I gave you the sex, but it comes with a manual. Read the manual. I can save you from all this. I can spare you the heartache and the guilt and the moral fallout that will dog your steps until Jesus gets a hold of you and recreates you. Location sensitive. Always location sensitive, whether you're alone, when you're with, whether you're with another, whether you're, whether you're with a, a whole group. Number five. Anatomy of temptation. Now look, we got a little bit, we got, we got a little bit uh, uh, focused on sex for a moment. We won't stay on sex because all temptation works the same way. Tell me what you have so far. What, 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 what's number one? Just call it out because I don't want to go back over my notes. What's number one? The temptation is always a shortcut. Thank you. What's number two? Betrayal of trust. Thank you. Number two. What's number three? What? Repetitive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't worry about me. Uh, number four, location sensitive. All right. Here comes number five. It's on the screen for you now. Temptation is always aggressive. Always aggressive. Look at verse 12. She caught him by his cloak. Day after day, day after day, this, wo this woman, this woman, does, a woman is not, hell hath no fury like a spurned woman. She does not want to take no for an answer. I am the lady of this house. Do you understand that? Now come to bed with me. I command you. Finally one day, verse 12, she caught him by his cloak. She said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and he ran out of the house. Always aggressive. You get close enough to her. You get close enough to him. You get close enough to it. Got you by the collar now. Always aggressive. Number six, jot it down. Temptation is always fleeable. Fleeable. But he left his coat in her hand. Adios, I'm out of here. And he ran without his coat. Temptation is always fleeable. You need to know that. If it's temptation to appetite, comfort food, you know how it is. I got to have this to feel good. 
Eat it. Have it now. All sex is is an appetite, isn't it? It's an appetite. Another one of the appetites. Got to have it now. Nobody will know. Take it. It's yours. Look it. You didn't even the score. It's always fleeable. Jot this down, will you? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, flee also. Flee also youthful lusts, which can track you into old age. Old men are not exempt from this temptation. Trust me. Flee also youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee, 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 flee. By the way, let me, tell you, let me just tell you this. The Bible has two morality tales. We're reading one of them. The other is one we're not going to get to. It's both young men, both achieving a level of prominence, one way up his name, young man, David. You know what the difference between Joseph and David was? Joseph fled. David fed. Put that on the screen, please. Joseph fled. David fed. You don't have to stay there. Click that mouse again. You don't have to go out. Click it again. You are never cornered. You are never boxed in. Oh, I love this. This is such great news. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13. Would you jot it down, please? No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to humankind, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will, with the temptation, always make the way of escape. Please write that down. There is always, it is always fleeable. There will always, if a temptation, look, if a temptation is coming to you right now, here's the deal. If it's a temptation and the inner voice of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead is saying, no, no, stop, stop, stop. If, the, if your conscience is saying no, and th therefore there's something tugging at you, if it is a temptation, you are guaranteed that there is immediately now an escape hatch right beside you. Not miles down the road, right here. You just turn, sir, 90 degrees. Turn 90 degrees. That door is open. And your guardian angel is saying, come on, let's go, 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 no, let's go. That door is always right beside you. It's not a block away. It's not a day away. It's in this instant. The door is there. With every temptation, God says, I promise you there'll be that door. They will always be that door, and my angel will be standing in that door. The angel that has tracked you your entire life, he will be standing in that door, and when that temptation comes, you're going to hear a voice inside of you say, this is the way, go. And if you go, I will deliver you. You go through that door. Isn't that a, isn't that a powerful promise? We are never boxed in. We are never cornered. We are never besieged by the enemy, but that God will blow open a way of escape. You are never trapped ever 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 the devil made me do it nope can't do it he has no authority he has no power over you you control your will it is the strongest it is the strongest human power you have been given the power of choice you will exercise it out go Shoot. wow Call upon me, this is Psalm 50, verse 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will glorify me. You call to me. You know, sometimes we don't even think about calling. I know I don't. I mean, the temptation is just, boom, you don't have time. Oh, God, save me. But if you've begun the day with God and you are already in this kind of, this, this, this I, I, I love the, my friend David Smith taking us through this hymn a moment ago, this, this pillar of fire, remember a pillar of fire at nine, a pillar of cloud by day? If you're in it, if you've gone to worship with God at the beginning of the day, if you've gone to worship with him, he's there. You won't have to say, let's see now, this is a temptation. I need to ask God help. You don't have to do that. Just go. He'll talk to you. Go. All right, finally, number seven. 
Temptation is not, not only always fleeable, it is always against God. Always. When beguiled by Mrs. Potiphar, come on. What does Joseph cry out? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against Mr. Potiphar? Is that what he said? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against Mrs. Potiphar? That would be you. Did he say that? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against me? Is that what he said? No, what did he say? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against my Lord and my Savior and my forever friend? How can I sin against him? In the, in the brute force of that explosive temptation, Joseph's mind vertically sweeps heavenward and he realizes God is watching this whole narrative. And he says, Mrs. Potiphar, I can't do this. I can't do this to him. I cannot do this to him. Would you jot it down? Genesis 39, 9. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Wow. Too late to prevent his moral meltdown, but not too late to be forgiven. David would write, compose, speaking of the Psalms, the, the, the greatest penitential prayer, the penitential hymn ever recorded in human literature. And it's Psalm 51. A few lines are tucked away from Psalm 51 in your study guide. Would you fill it in, please, David? His heart cry, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I hate to, I hate to keep picking on sexual sin, but have you noticed sexual sin leaves you feeling dirty when you're done? What's up with that? Maybe it's God's way of saying, you didn't want to go down there, did you? You didn't want to go down that path. You feel bad now. You need a shower. That's a metaphor that God has imprinted, embedded in our minds, and David cries out to God, wash away, please, wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. And now jot this down. Against you, you only, David and Joseph got it right. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Sin is always ultimately a sin against God, which bluntly stated means this. Whenever you sin, now this is just to make us feel just a tad bit uncomfortable. Whenever you sin, you do it in the presence of God. It's not like he says, hey, 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 Gabriel, close your eyes now. Don't look. No, they're all looking. You think God says, uh, uh, call me when you're done. You think he does that? No. He says, this is my boy. This is my girl. What is going on? Don't they know? Always, any sin is committed in the presence of the Almighty God. Would you jot that down? Whatever you do sexually, you do in front of God. Period. Joseph said, I'm always in the presence of my master. Our little daughter, our granddaughter, Ella. Can I tell you, can, 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 look, I haven't done a lot of granddaughter stories, have I? No, I have not. So I'm going to slip one in right here. 18 years old. 18 years old. Uh, 18. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 18 months old. Thank the Lord she's not 18 years. Just a, just a sweetheart, little Ella, looks just like our son Kirk, red, flaming red hair, and just the cutest little thing that ever walked the earth. But she, she so, so, so Ella, she came out, because my son and, and took our granddaughter away from us. They were living three miles down the road for one year with her, and then he went, moved out to Salem, Oregon, where he grew up as a boy. And he, he's a physician recruiter for a big hospital out there. So Ella's gone, but she came back. Uh, her mother brought her back for graduation because Chelsea had been student activity director at Andrews, and she had some students who were graduating. So Ella was in her house for a week. You know what Ella does? This, this is something. She, 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 she's learned the word no. <laughs> they picked that up pretty early probably. But anyway, she's learned, learned the word no. So uh, Karen would say to her or her mother or 
I never say no to her, so I don't know if she, she didn't <laughs> do this to me, but, uh, you know, Karen say, Ella, no. You know, she's touching something or whatever. Ella, no. And you know what Ella does? <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. It is so cute. <laughs> Ella, 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 don't touch that. Don't. <laughs> you know what she's doing? Wow, I could have had a V8. Why did I think of this? <laughs> no, she just knows that no, and she knows that she's in the presence because sometimes she'll be doing something there and you walk around the corner, Ella, no. Because she knows she's in the presence of one who knows what's right and wrong. And that's her way of just physically acknowledging that, emotionally acknowledging, you're right, I, should, I shouldn't have, what was I thinking? That's what we should do with the consciousness that, that God is watching this moment. Come on, Dwight. Come on, come on, come on. This is a, this, oh, this is a big one, Dwight. The door, the door, the door, the door. Come on. Yeah, hit, think, 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 think. Good, go. That's what we need to do. Every sin is in the presence of God. So why do it and embarrass him? Not to mention embarrass yourself. Yeah. Next time you... Re- you are tempted. Tuck that line away. This is going to be in God's presence. God, do I want this in your presence? Well, I think I'll do it outside of your presence. Yeah. Psalm 139, where can I flee? I go to hell, you're there. <laughs> you can't get away from him. He loves you that much, by the way. That's why you can't get away from him. He just loves you. Can't take his eyes off of you. You sure you want to do this? Are you sure? You know what Lucifer is asking you to do? Are you sure you want to do this? Forget it. Stay with me. The door. I'm here. I am the door, Jesus says. Run to me. Come here. Timothy Keller, who spends his ministry in New York City talking faith to skeptics, young skeptics, described his strategy with uh, dealing with temptation uh, with the young in New York City. And I, I thought this was good, and I'm... I'm moving to my wrap here, but I want to put Keller on the screen first. Instead of telling urban dwellers they are sinning because they are sleeping with their girlfriends or boyfriends, I tell them that they are sinning because they are looking to their romances to give their lives meaning, to justify and save them, to give them what they should be looking for from God. This idolatry, I tell them, he says, leads to anxiety, obsessiveness, envy, and resentment. I have found, I thought this is from an experienced uh, preacher and pastor, I have found that when you describe their lives in terms of idolatry, postmodern people, this generation, seculars, do not give much resistance. Then Christ and his salvation can be presented not at this point so much as their only hope for forgiveness, but as their only hope for freedom from idolatry. Now, you have to read that a few times, but you'll see what he's saying. Secular, as secular can be, you're an atheist, doesn't matter. You don't want to be controlled by something. Do you want to be controlled by this? Actually, there's, there's hope for both freedom and forgiveness in this story. And here, here we go. Do you know that Joseph, in the story of Joseph, in the narrative, he loses his robe twice? Isn't that right? When his brothers... Strip him of that robe and hurl him into that pit, then sell him to the Ishmaelites, then dip the robe in blood and come back to daddy. We've, is this your son's robe? Lost his robe at the beginning of the story. And with Mrs. Potiphar, he loses his robe. First robe was the robe of the father's beloved, second robe was the master servant's robe. Two robes gone. Guess what? When Jesus came, he lost two robes. First robe, the robe of the Father's beloved. As he stripped himself and said, I will go, Father, to earth. Robe one, off. And then as they yanked him to that crossbeam on the ground and ripped the garment off, throwing him down, the robe of the master servant, just like Joseph. He lost it. Two robes lost by Joseph. Two robes lost by Jesus. 
Jesus lost two robes so that he could give us one robe. It's no wonder to the age of earth's history that is the most sex-ridden and sex-guilty of human ages. It's no wonder to the church in Laodicea and only to this church at the end of the sex-burdened history of earth does Jesus make this offer. Put it on the screen. You know these words well. Revelation chapter 3. You go ahead and advance the slide. There you go. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 18, we know these words well. Therefore, I counsel you, church at the end of time, I counsel you to buy from me white robes to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen. For a generation plagued with nakedness on the billboards that we can't even hide our eyes from, riddled through the internet that we surf for godly purposes, for a generation riddled in nakedness by its own sexual experience or by living the life of a human on this planet. For a generation confronted with its nakedness, Jesus says, I gave up two robes, beloved of the Father and master servant. I gave up two robes to climb on Calvary so that through those two robes, I would have one robe for you, white, not a, not a fleck of stain or sin upon it, pure as the wind-driven snow. I offer you this white robe. Come, come here, come here. I offer you this white robe to cover your nakedness. Now go. Keep the robe on. Go. And sin no more. That's the offer. One new robe and the past covered forever and ever. Amen. What do you say? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Oh God, that's it. There it is. Joseph, Jesus, two robes stripped. But our Savior, stripped so that one robe, pure and white, might be draped about our guilty, broken hearts, the past forever now hidden, washed clean, washed by the blood of the Lamb, pure white. What a way to begin the Sabbath, Father. The hope of these hours unchained from the guilt that has dogged us through our lives, a robe to cover our nakedness. And so, Father, for every man, woman, young adult, and teenager in this room, please, that robe on that heart with this good news, neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave that sin behind and the power of the Christ who has given his robe we say thank you and let all the people say amen, amen and amen